Welcome back to the news at 10. We're looking at the level of infrastructure decay, particularly that of bridges and roads in the country. Joining me now is consulting engineer, Mr. Bayo Abdiola. Um, thank you for joining us on the news at 10 tonight. Um, we saw already from that report just before uh, the break, uh, the work on the Lagos Ibada Expressway and, you know, citizens complaining that, you know, the work has taken so long and so on. The question really is, why do we spend so long before we maintain roads? Why does it take so long before we, we go back and fix and, you know, put things in place before roads really deteriorate? I think the thing is that we don't maintain roads. We wait until the roads collapse and then we go and do major repairs. It's like you buy a car, you don't top up the water and you don't put engine oil in it regularly. A road is a pavement, something that is designed and it's used regularly and it should be maintained regularly. It's not periodic, it's not in three monthly intervals. We've seen some changes in Lagos State for instance, every day you see people clean the road. Every day you see those people clean the road, that should be backed up with people who inspect the road, anytime there's a crack on the road, you seal it. Mm. One of the things that causes the greatest damage to roads is water. Yeah. Once water undermines the pavement, it starts to fail and it starts to create potholes from a small puddle to a bigger one and you see them until they get to big crevices, nobody seems to attend to them. The road should be maintained from the point when the crack occurs, and that means a regular daily maintenance. It's not once a year, it's not twice a year. Or maybe the roads are not properly constructed, because if you construct roads, you have to construct drainages also. The reason the water destroys the roads is because the water does not have any outlet. Absolutely. Um, that is basic engineering. Basic engineering recognizes that you cannot design a road without taking proper care of the drainage. Water must flow away. Once water is retained on your pavement, then there is a problem already. The same thing with the shoulders. When we have the main carriageway, we have what we call the shoulders, mm -hmm. where people run. So the shoulder is not as hard as the main carriageway. So you undermine it. You remove all the protection. Water gets under your road. Your road gets bad. What leads to that? Indiscipline, bad behavior, of course, you raise the issue of the quality of the road in the first instance. I'm sure there's the parent land that you met there. If the parent land is not strong enough and the design is not properly done, you have a problem. Even when the design is properly done, if the construction work is not properly done, you have a problem. So maintenance, we just don't maintain roads. It's not a question of uh, poor maintenance. We don't maintain them at all. We wait until they break now. Yeah, but well, if, if governments were was being, if they, if they were to answer this that question, they would say, okay, sometimes there is also positive funds. You know, you have to plan for these things. They have to be in the budget. Sometimes, you know, it, it's huge money to fix roads. It's also huge money to also have to build a road from scratch. So do you think the government should go about maintaining roads with the little resources? Should it be the job of the federal government or should it be split amongst, you know, um, state governments, for example, where major roads pass through, could they also be allowed to maintain roads or given the responsibility to do, to do that instead of waiting for the federal government? I think proper infrastructure planning says that maintenance must be an integral part of the budget of the road. If you're not going to maintain the road, don't build it because you're just setting yourself up for failure. You will build a potential, then it will collapse, and then you're back to square one. I don't know how many times we've reconstructed a Papa Oshodi Expressway. We keep reconstructing them. It will cost us just a fraction to regularly maintain them. And they will always be available for use. But we run them down until they don't work at all. With the loss of revenue, the economic grinds, the tra travel time, the resources that show death or cost on the roads. It, it, don't build a road if you're not going to maintain it because it just doesn't make any sense to build a road. Now, who should maintain? I think it's everybody because I think the ownership of roads cuts across all the governments. There are federal government roads, there are state roads, there are local government roads. And each person who builds and owns a road should maintain them. And whatever you say, it's going to cost you a fraction of whatever it's going to cost you to reconstruct the road in the long run to maintain it. And in not maintaining it, it's like you are taking a national asset and you are allowing it to decay, you are allowing it to collapse. And then you will then take that resource 
to rebuild it all over again. It's like your roof is leaking. You don't repair your roof until your beds and your kitchen and your flats and everything that's collapsed. Then you rebuild your house. Then you don't do anything any again until it happens again. Well said, Mr. Bayadula. Thank you so much for joining us on the News at 10. You're welcome. Thank you very much indeed. To Ogun State now, where the government is saying that all is now set for the commencement of full academic activities in some of its model schools spread across the three senatorial districts from September this year. The State Deputy Governor, Mrs. Yetsunde Ononuga, gave the assurance while declaring open a two-week summer camp organized for students by the state government. Our model schools, not only one, will be starting in September by God's grace. The state government is ready. And we are just about to, to put finishing touches to all the other things that are supposed to be there. Forms are already in place, but they have not been distributed. We want to start with this summer camp so that after the summer camp, the experience the children have gained here, we speak volume about whether they want to be part of the model school, and I'm sure they're going to be part of the model school. Moving down to the southeast, in Anambra, trouble seems to be brewing in the state university as two camps have emerged in the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, over the appointment of an incoming vice chancellor. The reason for the division is that one of the groups does not want the reappointment of incumbent VC, Professor Fidelis Okafo, insisting that a properly constituted governing council be set up to look into it. One university, two factions of ASU, and the bone of contention is who becomes the next vice-chancellor of the Chukwemeka Odumegu Ojuku University, Igbariam, in Anambra State. We don't have a properly constituted governing council. So now, let us link this to the issue of vacancy in the office of the vice chancellor. It is the governing council that we announce vacancy, and it's usually announced about six months to the end of the tenure of a substantive vice chancellor. By the university law, which I have a copy here, of 2014, it is indeed the council, the governing council of the university that is empowered to declare vacancy in the post of the vice chancellor and most certainly not that of ASU. In the years of the institution, ASU has never been as divided as it is now. And some of the burning issues is the alleged refusal of the current vice chancellor to constitute a governing council for the institution since January 2015, in spite of the directive by the visitor to the university, Governor Willie Obiano, and the controversy over an attempt to persuade the governor not to reappoint the incumbent vice chancellor. The aim, we guess, was to get Congress endorsement for the letter reading to the visitor, the governor of the state, to the university, copied and circulated unbelievably, unimaginably, to 55, more than 55 other persons outside the, the university. They want to appoint him as the acting vice chancellor on the expiration of his term come September 4. And I told him, it is unacceptable to the union. Somebody cannot work in acting capacity, then work on substantive sub capacity, and then go back to work on acting capacity. Happening. While one of the groups led by Dr. Pascal Oguno dissociates itself from the agitation of the other group in the appointment of the vice chancellor, the opposition, ASU, led by comrade Emeka Wabunya, appeals to the visitor to remove all obstacles preventing the proper constitution of the governing council before the 4th of September when the tenure of the serving vice-chancellor is meant to expire and also appoint an acting vice-chancellor before then. And now to the arts. Pieces of Me is an exhibition of paintings and sculptures. The artist takes the viewer on a journey through his life experiences with a solo show.
artists can sometimes be extremely difficult to understand, especially when they are in work mode. Most are perceived to be eccentric introverts with what views of happenings around them. But the truth is that one needs to understand the way an artist thinks before passing judgment, and that will certainly help an art lover unravel the mysteries behind Pieces of Me, an exhibition by Joe Emenechi. He is an artist with diverse styles. Little wonder, as he honed his skills under the watchful eyes of a veteran, Dr. Bruce Onobrakwea, but he is definitely not the average Joe, carving, drawing, painting and sculpting a niche for himself. Pieces of Me is an attempt by the artist to show his diverse styles for the viewer to understand where he is coming from or going. And there is a lot to see, from works done in acrylic on canvas, Pencil drawing. Beadwork. Metal foil. Mixed media and bronze. artist has relayed the influence, the motifs and folklore from the cultures of the Benin, Igbo, Nok and Yoruba kingdoms. So when you were tempted to pass quick judgment on an artist's character, take a look in the mirror. You might see something interesting. The National Association of Resident Doctors in the South South is still up in arms over what it calls the poor state of health facilities and welfare of doctors in the region. At a crucial meeting summoned by its leadership in Port Harcourt River State, the union emphasized the need for federal health institutions to be given better attention. The caucus leader, Dr. Uilua, who spoke on behalf of the group, says the federal government must intervene and look into the welfare of doctors in the South South. The South South zone of the country, unfortunately, has one of the worst health indices maternal mortality rate, under five mortality rate. Perinatal mortality rate, it is a, an increase in emergence of cancers in the country. There is a complete death of specialist care available to the people of the South South. The federal tertiary health institutions and those that run hospitals in the region have been operating below par in the last five years, especially in the comparison to hospitals in other ge geopolitical zones of the country. The South South Zone currently has most of its federal teaching health institutions engaging in industrial actions. It was also observed that other members of the Niger Delta University Teaching Hospitals have been owed five months of... Next on the news at 10, Manchester United and Liverpool record impressive victory on match day one in the English Premier League. We'll have more in sports news this day with us.